Welcome to Model 3 for Women and Youth Empowerment in Agriculture. In Model 3, we are going to examine some of the problems and policies required for agricultural development. This will examine us. This will allow us to examine some options and challenges for empowering women and youth. At the end of this model, we expect you, the participants, to be able to undertake a sector-wide analysis of the problems and policies for agricultural development with options for empowering women and youth. This is because the model will have provided you with an understanding of the problems and policies for agricultural development with options for empowering women and youth. In way of an introduction, let's remind ourselves that Africa's agriculture faces a lot of challenges which constrain it from performing well to address food security, supply industrial raw materials and income, particularly from international trade. Agricultural production and productivity in the continent is primarily constrained by natural factors as well as ineffective agricultural policy and weaknesses in the adoption of technologies. These constraints inhibit the rural economy's potential either to alleviate poverty through employment creation and income generation or meet growing food needs driven by rapid population growth and urbanization, as well as stimulate overall economic growth, given that agriculture is the most potential lead sector for growth and development for developing countries. In fact, these constraints pose as a challenge for African agricultural sector to be able to conserve natural resources. If we could summarize, we will therefore say that the three key challenges in Africa's agricultural sector include feeding a growing population through adequate food security, providing a livelihood for farmers through better incomes, as well as protecting the environment. And these three challenges must be tackled together if African countries are to make sustainable progress in any of them. However, making progress on this triple challenge is difficult as initiatives in one domain can have unintended consequences in another with significant effects on women and youth groups. When we talk of rural industrialization, income diversification and livelihoods to address poverty and inequality, we have to recall that rural industrialization is basically about properly utilizing the rich but unexploited resources in rural areas. It essentially concerns the involvement of industries in the development of, an, of a locality or an area, and also participation by rural entrepreneurs in the growth of industries best suited to that spe specific locality or area. The process of rural industrialization is not only about industries being transplanted into a specific area, but the process of using more modern methods to improve on the activities and products from that area. The sole objective of rural industrialization is to improve rural areas by tapping vast material and human resources existing within the countryside. The process of rural industrialization should have its own features, such as labor intensity and use of simple technology by employing local human and material resources. Hence, we are talking of a judicious mix of local manpower with the, with the local resource being necessary to bring about a viable development in a particular area. Like we've seen in the other models, we can recall that rural industries principally depend on rural production for raw materials, as well as even the rural population for marketing of the immediate products that come from the farm state. The rural industries provide immediate large scale employment, and they also offer a method of ensuring a more equitable distribution of national income. They facilitate an effective mobilization of resources, capital, and skills, which might otherwise remain unutilized. And some of the problems that unplanned urbanization tends to create will be avoided by the establishment of small centers of industrial production all over the country, in the rural countryside in particular. Therefore, we expect that industrialization improves livelihood by promoting income diversification in the countryside. 
the improvement of livelihood will imply growth in the household welfare. Livelihood diversification will also mean a process of dynamic change and constant adaptation. Attempts are, are typically being made by individuals and households to find new ways of raising incomes and reduce risk, which differ sharply by the degree of freedom of choice and reversibility of the outcome. In summary, and in a nutshell, when we talk of livelihood, livelihood addresses the capabilities, the assets, the access and activities required for a healthy living in a household. And households have to diversify their livelihood in order to create opportunities. Livelihood diversification includes both on the farm and off the farm activities, which are undertaken to generate additional income from the major agricultural activities through the production of subsidiary agricultural and non-agricultural products and services, the sale at times, especially at the peak farming season of, for wage labor, or self-employment in small firms and other strategies undertaken by households to minimize risks. Women and youths are therefore increasingly involved in livelihood diversification. In summary, therefore, we can say diversification is divided into two, on-farm diversification, that's what it takes place on the farm, and off-farm or non-farm diversification, the diversification that takes place out of the farm. With respect to on-farm diversification, this is the maintenance of a, di of a diverse spread of crops and livestock production activities that interlock with each other in various ways. Okay, you've seen in some African farming systems, examples of mixed cropping, multiple cropping, intercropping, which allows farmers to diversify in case one of the crops or commodities fail, there will be a fallback on another commodity which could be used for food or market income. On the other hand, non-farm diversification refers to seeking business or employment opportunities other than in the traditional crop production or livestock rearing. Even non-farm diversification is related to agriculture as it includes processing and trading of agricultural products. Also, non-farm activities include service provision, trade and business, as well as manufacturing. So non-farm diversification will include activities that takes place off the farm, but along the value chain, the agricultural production chain, right up to the consumer. Rural livelihood diversification is not new in Africa. However, in the past, it has relied mainly on agriculture related diversifications. Traditional farming has proven to be limited to significantly contribute to improved livelihoods. The new dispensation is to associate livelihood diversification with increased processing, manufacturing and value addition along the agricultural value chain. It thus needs more attention from policymakers during this time of food insecurity and high population growth. Still, on the opportunities and challenges that befall policymakers and the agricultural sector is the issue of rural urban migration. Rural urban migration. This is a movement of surplus labor from rural areas to urban areas. This could be healthy if it is organized and planned to avoid urban sprawl. However, in most countries in Africa, rural urban migration is unplanned, bringing with it more challenges for economic planners. Migration implies the movement of individuals from one place to another, either for short or long-term periods, perhaps for economic motive. Although you could have migration as a result of political strife, as a result of environmental difficulties and challenges like droughts and floods, but in general, in times of peace, migration is linked largely to socioeconomic challenges. The challenge, therefore, is to address the structural drivers of large movements of people so that migration remains safe, orderly, and regular. In this way, migration can become a true force to contribute to economic growth and improve food security and rural livelihoods. Thus, advancing countries see progress in achieving the famous sustainable development goals of the United Nations, which many countries sign up to, including the 54 African member states of the African Union. 
Migration is triggered by the desire of people in less developed areas to move into modern economy for peace and prosperity purposes. As we saw in module one, in the Lewis's dual sector model, as well as the Faye Rennes's supply labor model, migration could be a response to the high demand of labor by an industrial sector, which assures workers greater levels of productivity and for investors, positive profits superior to the opportunities found in the traditional agricultural sector in rural areas. The economic development models, therefore, may provide some theoretical justification of the rural urban migration trends and patterns, as well as its associated consequences. Migration may also be regarded as an alternative to diversified livelihoods because of individual assist vulnerability, low resilience, capacity, and the perceived low income from the farm activities. Entitlements to assets and productive resources, life cycle factors, gender role barriers, lack of education, lack of financial services and training opportunities, gender norms and mobility and individual aspirations are notable barriers responsible for the vulnerable economic conditions, especially in rural areas, which often push members of the family to consider migration to urban centers. Migration, therefore, is not only a to escape poverty, it is an opportunity for rural young people to feel a sense of pride, self-respect, and be viewed as leaders within their family and their broader community. Young people, therefore, typically view migration as an avenue to improve their status, learn new skills, and transit into adulthood. As a consequence, migration continues to serve as the means to improve rural livelihoods. With youths being an integral component of the migrant population, both in terms of volume and the effects they have on both their points of origin and destination, rural youth who migrate are particularly disadvantaged after, after undertaking a migration, which inadequately developed with inadequately developed education and skills, many youths find limited employment opportunities when they move into cities. Most face a future of low wage employment, underemployment, poverty, drugs, and crime. In fact, the arrival of rural migrants may worsen the situation by expanding the pool of young urban job seekers, which reduces the pressure on employers to offer competitive incomes and work standards to their, to their workers. Africa's urban centers are therefore becoming extremely overcrowded because of migration, overburdened, putting pressure on insufficient infrastructure in the urban areas, schools, health facilities, sanitation, and water systems. This escalating urbanization has created a new context of poverty in which urban centers are overtaxed and unprepared to absorb increasing youth employment. In absolute numbers, youth unemployment becomes more prevalent in urban areas than rural areas. Another important challenge facing the agricultural sector for economic development, agrarian development, and the empowerment of women and youth is human capital formation. What is human capital? Human capital is a broad concept which identifies human characteristics which can be acquired and which can increase income. It is commonly taken to include people's knowledge and skills acquired partly through education, but can also include their strength and vitality, which are dependent on their health and nutrition. In understanding the role of human capital as an input into development, it is therefore necessary to consider the possible links between human capital, other forms of capital, income, and growth. Human capital can be any form of investment in people. Human capital development can be acquired through schooling, training programs, experience on the job training, health, good health, migration. In this case, migration as an investment to leave a poor labor market, a disadvantaged rural area, for instance, and move to a good labor market uh, or an urban center with opportunities. Human capital formation can also come from pre-market and pre-schooling investments by parents on their children to give them an 
to give them a head start. And we may score all of these as early life investments. Health and education are both components of human capital and contributors to human welfare. In fact, human development views health and education as being intrinsically linked, valuable outcomes to be placed alongside economic production as measures of human welfare. The United Nations Human Development Index for Human Welfare, which incorporates income, education, and health, shows that Africa's level of human development is the lowest in any region in the world. And the HDI, or the Human Development Index, takes into consideration income, education, and health. Both physical and human capital, therefore, directly impact on the productive capacity of an economy, whether urban or rural. More human capital may itself affect the rate of growth of physical capital. If human and physical capital are complements, then increasing human capital raises the rate of return on physical capital. So what they're trying to say here is that when you have physical capital, like machines and money, an educated human capital will better organize the physical capital of machine and money. Therefore, both go together. More human capital may affect, therefore, the rate of growth of physical capital. The underlying rate of technical progress in any economy may therefore depend on how much educated labor force there is in the economy. This therefore means that investing in women and youth is critical given their role in agricultural value chains, as well as women's role in food and nutrition security. It is important to strengthen the entrepreneurial and technical skills of women and youth and to provide them with training and capacity building while harnessing their innovative potential. Education is key, therefore, to facilitating women and youth's access to information and better technologies, which are critical to moving beyond production and running successful rural businesses. Again, investing in education for women and youth while strengthening their entrepreneurial capacities is insufficient without creating an enabling environment, positioning them with better access to productive access, assets and markets. We saw earlier that health is part of human capital and food is health and good health is wealth. It is therefore important to develop a gender sensitive agricultural and nutrition policies in order to boost attention to rural women as key actors of food and nutrition security while overcoming the challenge of feeding an increasing population. Agriculture can contribute to nutrition, good food, healthy food for a workforce. By increasing the food production and income of smallholder households, agriculture can support the availability and affordability of a diverse diet while increasing households' earnings which could potentially be used for the purchase of food and non-food goods, as well as services important to, to family health and nutrition. Improved access to nutritious, diverse diets and increased expenditure on health and nutrition may be more likely to be achieved and sustained if women are empowered. So there is therefore every reason for women, the managers of households, to be empowered. When, empower, when women are empowered, not only agricultural productivity rises, infant mortality declines, child health improves, especially when women are empowered through better human capital formation. There is also infrastructure challenges that bedevil Africa's agricultural sector, constraining its economic growth and development. And one of Sub-Saharan Africa's top developmental challenge continues to be the shortage of physical infrastructure. Greater economic activity, enhanced efficiency, and increased competitiveness are hampered by inadequate transport, inadequate communication, inadequate water, and inadequate power infrastructure. You know, the world is, big, is eager to do business with Africa. There are lots of conferences, international meetings about attracting investors into, into Africa. And the world is eager to do business with Africa, but the world finds it difficult to access African markets 
especially in the interior, due to poor infrastructure. Poor infrastructure with respect to transportation, roads, railway, seaports, airports, inadequate communication infrastructure, inadequate water supplies, inadequate power and electricity supplies. The lack of infrastructure is therefore a serious obstacle to growth and development. This results in a low level of intra-African trade itself, as well as trade with other regions. Poor infrastructure in Africa is often listed as one of the major challenges to agricultural growth and development for the continent. The agricultural sector is highly dependent on energy. The agricultural sector depends on telecommunications, on water security, on transportation. So there is a close alignment between improving this infrastructure and agricultural development. If farmers in the continent are to produce enough food to feed a growing population, while also sustaining a living from agriculture, sufficient infrastructure needs to be put in place. Infrastructure can connect farmers with national, regional, and global markets, linking them to inputs needed for the sector to survive. Strangely, however, less than 50% of the rural population lives close to adequate roads, which poses serious challenge and difficulty for farmers to transport inputs to use in their farms, and well as, as well as to evacuate and take out output or products that came from their farms. This coupled with poor storage facilities across countries in the continent leads to post-harvest losses, such that nearly 30% or one third of agricultural production either arrives in poor condition or never makes it to the consumer at all. This food waste, is extremely detrimental to food security, detrimental to material supplies, and detrimental to stability of incomes. In other words, food losses and food waste may, may reinforce food insecurity, lead to raw material deficiency and instability in incomes. Therefore, Africa must solve the infrastructure challenge physical infrastructure covering transportation, power and communication through its backward and forward linkages shall facilitate growth, while social infrastructure, including water supply, sanitation, sewage disposal, education and health, which are in the nature of primary services, will have a direct impact on the quality of life of African people. Without this infrastructure, Africa will not achieve the growth levels expected or required. Without this infrastructure planning and investments, which are critical for Africa's huge economic and developmental potential to be realized, investments in infrastructure will in general have beneficial effects on women and youth practicing agriculture. It's not only investments in infrastructure that are important. There are other investments that are also required from government and policymakers in the, to support the agricultural sector. Here, let's examine now investments and national incentives for rural and agricultural development. Again, let's remind ourselves that social, economic, and environmental footprint of investment in agriculture and food systems cannot be underestimated. We have re echoed over and over how these investments in agriculture and food systems are important because there is a growing population. Like Thomas Malthus posited that population is growing in a geometric progression, while food production is growing in an arithmetic progression. In other words, population may outgrow food production and leading to farming. The world's population is expected to reach almost 10 billion people in the year 2050, requiring a significant increase in the amount of affordable, healthy, and nutritious food that is produced. Investments in agriculture and food systems are generating great optimism in terms of their potential to ensure the livelihoods of millions of people working along the agricultural value chains and improve the environmental sustainability of the sector. Increasing public investments in physical infrastructure, such as roads, can generate significant benefits, particularly in production and post-harvest activities. Policymakers must involve the private sector by creating a favorable environment and by promoting private investments in storage, processing, and marketing infrastructure. 
will require inclusive business models. Governments have to promote inclusive business models. The government and its technical and financial partners will have to encourage the private sector to invest in models that offer beneficial prospects to smallholder farmers by providing them with knowledge and access to input and output markets. There are value chain development projects demonstrating the viability of such inclusive business models, which put small producers at the heart of the agricultural system and provides the private sector the prospect of a reasonable profit. These good practices must be scaled up. These good practices will have to be scaled up through growth enhancing investments and as well as other incentives that will increase the performance of the sector. Boasting rural investments in Africa will definitely create millions of much needed jobs as well as food security and resilience in the rural areas. A world free of hunger and poverty cannot be achieved by year 2030 without substantial increase in capital flows in agriculture and food systems. Investments may bring in much needed capital in support of national agricultural modernization, as well as the potential to positively contribute to a range of national development objectives. Achieving the SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals will require a significant increase in the quantity and quality of investments in agriculture and in the rural areas. The Committee on World Food Security identified principles for responsible investments in agriculture and food systems. And these principles are very, very comprehensive, as we shall see in the figure below. The principles for responsible investment in agriculture serve as a framework to guide the actions of policymakers and other stakeholders engaged in agriculture and food systems. The principles for responsible investment in agriculture emphasizes sustainable economic development, poverty eradication, gender equality, and women's empowerment, youth participation, respect for land tenure, and natural resource management and conservation. The principles aim to promote safe and healthy agriculture and food systems and incorporate transparent and inclusive governance structures, procedures, and redress mechanisms. Here we have the 10 principles of for responsible for responsible investment in agriculture and food system. Principle number one, contribute food security and nutrition. Principle two, contribute to sustainable and inclusive economic education of poverty. Principle number three, foster gender equality and women's empowerment. Four, engage and empower the youth. Five, respect tenure of land, fisheries, forests, and access to water. Six, conserve and sustainably manage natural resources, increase resilience, and reduce disaster risks. Seven, respect cultural heritage and traditional knowledge and support diversity and innovation. Eight, promote safe and healthy agriculture and food systems. Nine, incorporate inclusive and transparent governance structures, processes, and grievance mechanisms. And turn, assess and address impacts and promote accountability. Overall, the most important factors are access to market, potential profit, passion or interest of the business investor, as well as political stability. We will, we will need tax incentives to encourage entrepreneurs involved in the sector. However, incentives alone cannot promote investment or account for the lack of infrastructure and other faults in the country's investment environment. Therefore, before tax incentives have been provided, infrastructure has to be, has to be provided as well as conditions to improve on the investment climate. How to promote private investment in the agricultural sector, the government and its development partners should invest in infrastructure development, especially in rural areas. Government should also work with tra traditional authorities to address land access, land acquisition, and land tenure insecurity challenges in rural areas. The government should better coordinate with development partners and financial institutions to provide loans to agribusinesses at appropriate interest rates and terms, which obligate farmers to start servicing such loans only when they start harvesting crops. These efforts 
overall will have beneficial effects on women and youths. In the face of the challenges experienced by African agriculture, there is also urban agriculture, which is emerging and gathering momentum. So we do not have to look at only agriculture in the rural areas, but also agriculture in the peri-urban and urban areas. The African Capacity Building Foundation, ACBF, defines urban agriculture as any agricultural enterprise within or on the fringes of a town, a city, or a metropolis that grows or raises, processes, and distributes food and non-food products. Urban populations are growing faster in Africa than all other regions of the world. Africa's population is expected to be 2.5 billion by the year 2050, 2.3 billion in 2020. It is likely that new urban population will demand more access to cereals, to dairy and meat products, as well as to vegetables, fruits, fats, oils, and than the previous generation did, which resided largely in the rural areas. Feeding Africa's cities and urban centers and providing access to good quality food presents a major challenge. However, it also means a major opportunity for the continent's urban farms. Where you see a challenge, it may induce an opportunity by those who want to take advantage of the challenge, look for the necessary resources, and become a force of good to resolve that challenge. Out of total urban food sales, roughly $200 billion per year, over 80% comes from African domestic suppliers. The most rapidly growing urban food markets are for processed, prepared, and perishable foods, especially dairy, poultry, meat, fish, and horticulture. Food, in fact, is an effective entry point to improve a city's resilience. It impacts many urban issues such as transportation, health, land use, and waste management. Worldwide, urban agriculture involves around 800 million people and generates opportunities not just for farmers, but for traders, suppliers, and other service providers. In Africa, 40% of urban dwellers are involved in agriculture and related sectors. Bringing farming techniques to cities can benefit citizens across the continent, especially women and youths. Whether it is rural agriculture or urban agriculture, whether it is about, whether it is about rural urban migration or human capital formation, other challenge which is omnipresent in the face of African agricultural policy makers is the environmental degradation challenge and the increasing phenomenon of global warming associated with climate change. Environmental degradation in general is a deterioration of the environment through depletion of resources such as air, water, and soil, the destruction of ecosystems, as well as the extinction of wildlife. Environmental degradation, which is a challenge or a constraint for the agricultural sector, can be defined as any change or disturbance to the environment perceived to be dangerous or deleterious or undesirable. When natural habitats are destroyed or natural resources are depleted, environment is said to be degraded. The United Nations International Strategy for Disaster Reduction defines environmental degradation as the reduction of the capacity of the environment to meet social objectives and needs. Environmental degradation is one of the 10 threats officially cautioned by the high level threat panel of the United Nations. Environmental degradation can be attributed to various human activities and some natural processes. Most of the resources on the planet are vulnerable to depletion and the rate at which we are exploiting them have already brought some of them to the brink of exhaustion. Explo exploitation of fossil fuels is a good example of this phenomenon. Last scale exploitation of fossil fuels has depleted fuel reserves across the world, thus leaving mankind with no option but to find an alternate source of energy. Other human activities which are contributing to environmental degradation include urbanization, 
overpopulation, deforestation, pollution, hunting, and so on. The increasing frequency of increasing prevalence of environmental disasters undermine economic development as they negatively impact on environmental, social, agricultural sectors, but more critically on the agricultural sector. The effects include agricultural crop failures, loss of livestock, water shortages, outbreak of epidemic diseases, hunger and poverty. Other direct impacts include death, especially on environmental disasters such as drought, floods. Another impacts will include injury to humans, destruction of property, disruption of economic activities, damage of proper, to properties and natural resources. Estimates show that globally, for example, the number of people at risk of hunger due to climate shocks will increase in the years ahead to almost between 10 and 20% by year 250, and 65% of these will be in Africa. In 2010, climate-related disasters demonstrated the vulnerability of African nations to food insecurity. An example includes the drought in Niger, which was followed by heavy rains, destroying crops and livestock, and in post is Niger. There, are, there has all been recorded over the decades in, in the whole Africa, affecting Somalia, Eritrea, Djibouti, and parts of Kenya. Disasters occur, women and youths are the most vulnerable. Women and youths are the most vulnerable in the face of uh, youth blind actors in the fight against poverty in the household. According to the World Bank, about 1% in two, in two, that's almost 50%, subsist on less than 1.25 US dollar per day, with approximately 70% of these living in rural areas. Food security and livelihoods for the rural poor are at risk, as almost all countries in sub-Saharan Africa grain fed agriculture, and therefore they become very vulnerable to where climate in a situation where women and youths are disadvantaged to access production resources and markets, such climatic and weather shocks, as well as other environmental risks, reinforces the vulnerability of children. The rural youth are most affected by poverty. True, according to the World Bank, three out of every four live on less than two US dollars per day. Two out of every four rural youth, three out of every four rural youth live on less than two US dollars, meaning they lack resources and skills to be competitive. Young women in particular are at a disadvantage. Rural young women in Africa need special attention as gender disparities continue to impede young girls' acquisition of decent and employable skills. These are accentuated by the pressures of early marriage and child rearing which leads to a cycle of limited choices. Most females in the continent are married off before the age of 24, with parenthood occurring even earlier. When school enrollment and dropout rates higher for, are higher for younger girls, the impact of cultural norms and role models restrict young women's option to early motherhood, restricts them to unpaid domestic work. Increasing urban populations and shrinking formal employment opportunities add up to contribute to widespread urban poverty and insecurity in the African continent. Urban youth are hit particularly hard. They are expected to reach financial independence as a first step in the transition to adulthood, yet they are overrepresented in underemployment and unemployment rates across the continent. Large unemployed youth population, which we refer to in module two as the youth bulge, are often stigmatized as a threat to peace and security. Resolving these challenges will involve the first major step of increasing the access to productive resources for women and youth. Women are marginalized across the agrarian landscape in Africa is no more news. That they face multiple challenges 
which include lack of access to land and productive access, credit and market, first, market opportunities is well known. That they are marginalized and excluded from the lucrative parts of the agricultural value chain is well known. That this includes suffering the brunt of negative policy options, such as large scale land deals and also climate change is well established by many experts that women owned farms will be most by phenomenon, which includes climate risks or climate change, as well as the invasion of the continent for the acquisition of land to grow food for other richer countries in the world, typically referred to as land grabbing or land deals, will be disadvantageous to women and, and youths because that is the land which they themselves ought to have had access to. Agriculture is thus largely constructed as a patriarchal system in which women play subordinate roles. Such a state of affairs poses serious challenges, given that the vast majority of African women are in some way dependent on agriculture as a source of livelihood. Yet, they are, they, there are very limited interventions focused on increasing women's access to key agrarian resources, especially land. Whether women or young people will engage in farming depends on how productive and profitable farming is now and in the future. This profitability in turn depends on agricultural policies and programs that will help women and youth adopt new technologies, access productive resources such as land, credits, and markets. These opportunities will really drive young people to seek viable and attractive career options in the agricultural sector. In summary, therefore, it is important that the following recommendations are taken into consideration when designing and implementing national investment plans in agriculture to enhance gender responsiveness, thus ensuring women's effective integration into the agribusiness value chain. First, women, women have to be targeted to access productive resources. We need gender responsive extension service delivery. There is need for women responsive access to skill level and new technologies. There is need for infrastructure and telecommunication development for enhanced women access, facilitating gender sensitive market access and development, facilitating cross border trade to improve women's participation, gender sensitive innovation, innovative financial products and financial planning which shall be required. Effective communication and strengthened advocacy is essential, as well as increased gender awareness and sensitivity in policy and program development. Effective inclusion and implementation of the above listed recommendations for agricultural investments will support and facilitate preferential entry and participation for women into gainful and attractive agribusiness opportunities as mandated in Africa's Agenda 2063 and the 2014 Malabo Declaration. It will deepen initiatives undertaken by African governments, regional and sub-regional organizations towards gender equality and women empowerment, as well as increase women's access to productive resources and raise agricultural production by almost 4%, then reduce the number of hungry people by almost 150 million world worldwide and significantly increase gross domestic product significantly reduce the unemployment challenge faced by many African economies as gainful job opportunities will be opened to a large segment of the population, especially women and youth who are currently underutilized and underserved. It is therefore clear that there are different challenges that face women and youth in their participation in Africa's agricultural sector. There will be need for investments in hard and soft infrastructure. There will be need for investments on infrastructure such as roads, market facilities, storage facilities, transportation systems, as well as human capital formation and to better manage rural urban migration so that migration becomes a force of value rather than a curse leading to urban sprawl and low quality of life in the urban centers. Thank you.